The topic is joy in your presence. Do you have it? The first miracle Jesus did was in a little town called Cana of Galilee. Now Jesus is called in the Bible a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That is true. Jesus was not a frivolous person. But Jesus loved parties because Jesus loved people. And so Jesus, his mother, and Jesus' disciples are invited to a wedding. And after the wedding's been going on for a while, they run out of wine. We all do, you know. We run out of it. We run out of the wine of life. And so Jesus performs his first great miracle. He turns some water in these big stone jars. He turns some water into wine. And when the guests taste the wine, it is so good. And the master of the feast, the MC, comes and he says, this is quite amazing because he says, you've saved the best till now. You know the story. Now the wine represents the joy of the gospel. It is the best. The wine of the world will surely run out. And if you're drinking the wine of the world sooner or later, you're going to be very, very, very frustrated and dissatisfied. But if you taste the wine of God, you will say, you have saved the best till now. The wine is a symbol of divine joy. That's what we're going to talk about today. Divine joy. Joy in your presence. Would you please take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 25 and onwards. Acts chapter 2 and verse 25 and onwards. Now I want to tell the folks watching on television across the United States and around the world and across Australia, this church here in Arcadia is a Bible reading, Bible believing, Bible carrying church. That's what, hold up your Bibles folks. I want the folks in television to see that there's a church where people bring their Bibles. <laughs> because we don't take it from the preacher, we take it from the Bible. This is the Word of God. Acts chapter 2, verse 25 and onwards. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad. And my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Now, the context is an interesting context because we've got a fisherman who's doing the preaching. And this is Peter preaching at the time of Pentecost. And to show that Jesus is the real Messiah, he quotes King David, because these words were written by the King of Israel. He quotes King David from Psalm 16. Please turn to that. Psalm 16, verses... 8 to 11, dear hearts and gentle people. Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. I've set the Lord always before me, David said. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. You got that? Psalm 16, verse 9. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You've made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures 
at your right hand. Now come back to Acts 2, because Peter argues that this prophecy was not fulfilled or filled full in David, because he died and did not ascend to heaven. So it must be talking about the Messiah. Acts chapter 2, verse 29 and onwards. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised, on, promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. You see that? It's about the Christ. That he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now listen carefully to just a tiny bit of theology. This is a messianic prophecy and it was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus, his body did not see corruption, but he was raised and taken home to glory. Therefore, it is fulfilled in the resurrected Christ. But the joy that Christ knew in the presence of the Lord can be yours when you are in Christ. When you are in the promised seed, you can know the joy that is found in the presence of the Lord. My topic is joy in your presence as it applies not only to Jesus, but to us. And the King James Version says, you will fill me with joy in your presence. That means you'll be filled overflowing. Now, because I consider myself to be organized, this sermon is likewise organized. And will have major heads and subtitles. Point number one, the presence. You will fill me with joy in the presence of the Lord. There is indeed a divine presence in contrast to nothing. The great Christian scholar Francis Schaeffer wrote a book that every one of you ought to read through, even though it is difficult to read. It is good to read difficult books because it makes the mind work and saves us from our minds going to waste. He wrote a book entitled, The God Who Is There. The great argument is the, of the book is that in spite of all of the philosophies of men, there is a God and he is there. So there is a divine presence. Professor Richard Dawkins from Oxford University is probably the greatest atheist or the most famous atheist in the world. He says... The laws of nature demonstrate that God is unnecessary. But has he ever thought in his wildest imagination why the laws of nature? He pushes it all back 
to the laws of nature, but what lies behind, uh, I say, Professor Dawkins, the laws of nature. How do we know God exists? There are many reasons. Let me suggest to you three. Number one, and I say this particularly to the unbeliever, like Richard Dawkins, number one, and let me come to my high-tech blackboards, <laughs> which I've been using for 50 years. There is, did you know that over here in America, on Fox News, Glenn Beck is using my blackboard. <laughs> and people are like, boy, isn't this a neat idea? If you're old-fashioned long enough, you'll soon be back in style. Prophecy. Prophecy. I'm going to give you three Ps. I want you to think, we're not going to turn to it, I want you to think of some of the prophecies of the Bible, like Daniel chapter 7. This never fails to move me when I preach it, when I talk about the lion, the bear, the leopard, the monster, the ten horns, the little horn that comes up, the rules for 12, 60 years. Now, this is old hat with you, but it's not with unbelievers. I have seen, I don't know, vast numbers. I have seen hundreds of thousands of atheists and communists come to believe in God because of prophecy. When you study prophecy, the evidence is overwhelming that there is a God. As one theologian said, if genuine prophecy exists, then the main issues of our age are met. And the Bible is the only book in the world that contains genuine prophecy. Firstly, prophecy. That's number one. Number two, this is a proof of God. Number two, and that is personal, personal experience. Personal experience. Now, if you haven't had it, then don't criticize somebody who has Richard Dawkins. Now, what am I talking about? Come over here to 1 John 5 and verses 9 and 10. This is towards the end of the Bible, 1 John chapter 5 and verses 9 and 10. John says, we accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given us about his Son. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony where? It says in his heart. The Bible says you can have the testimony of God in your heart. Now come over here to Romans 8 verse 16. This is one of the greatest of all proofs. Some would say it's the greatest proof. Romans 8 and uh, verse 16, because you don't have to be a theologian, you don't have to be smart, you don't have to be wealthy, you simply need to believe. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now look at me. When Samuel Wesley, the father of John and Charles and, and the rest of the clan, when he was dying, he called his family to himself and he said, almost in his dying breath, remember the inner witness. It is the greatest proof of Christianity. Either you've got it today or else you don't have it. I was talking to my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Graham Bradford, he said, Thank God we have the inner witness. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God and you can know that you're going home to glory. That is the inner witness. Now, I want you to imagine that a being arrives not from another planet but from another universe. 
and he comes here to church. He is completely unlike us. He doesn't eat the sort of food we eat. What right has he to tell me what a banana tastes like? How could I describe to him the eating of a banana? And I tell my Australian and American friends, there are obviously two different types of these. In America, they have bananas. But in Australia, they have bananas. <laughs> but I can testify to the fact that they taste the same. And the only way you can tell what a banana is like is not through some scientific dissertation, but by tasting it. That's the inner witness. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Some person will come to me and say, I don't like an avocado, possibly because you've never tasted it. How could you explain or describe to an alien from another world what an apple was like? The best thing to do would be to say, taste it. And so I say to the unbeliever who scoffs about Christianity, taste and see, and you will know it is true. We have the witness in ourselves. The Spirit himself bears witness. The third greatest proof of God that I know of is the person of Christ himself. He's so good he could not have been invented. Come over here to John chapter 8 and verse 12. John chapter 8 and verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. What an incredible statement. Think of any person today saying this. Think of any politician, any wise man saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Nobody else could say that. A great scholar made this statement. Christ is the only person who ever lived to claim to be God and yet was considered sane by the best of his contemporaries. Anybody else who claims to be God is a deluded madman. From this Galilean Jew have come unceasing streams of benevolence for the good of mankind. Christ himself is the greatest argument for the presence of God. And we should write this up. Point number three. Number three. Christ himself. The very personality of Christ himself. We have prophecy, personal experience. Let us write up here the person. The person of Christ. Christ was either the God-man or a madman. Don't say he's nice and he's good and yet do not believe in him. That is, as C.S. Lewis said, to patronize him. He is either God or else he's mad. The person of Christ, where Jesus and his gospel go, there is light, peace, happiness, and health. Don't confuse, as does the great Professor Dawkins, Jesus was man-made religion. He hates all religion. He'll talk about the Inquisition. But such a discussion is completely irrelevant, and he ought to know better, but he doesn't. Jesus is distinct. And wherever he goes, those nations that accepted the teaching of the gospel became the greatest and the most prosperous nations under heaven. But those same nations that today are turning away from Christ and the gospel are going downhill big time. 
And so, three evidences for the presence of the Lord. Prophecy, personal experience, and the third, which is the greatest, is the person of Christ. A simple, uneducated man was confronted by a militant atheist who derided his faith and gave him a thousand reasons why the Bible was wrong and why there was no God. This poor man was overwhelmed by the torrent of words that came from the mouth of the unbeliever. And he had no answers. You know, we don't always have to have an answer. And this man did not have the answers. But he said, I cannot answer your intellectual scientific arguments, but I can tell you one thing. It wasn't long ago when my children were afraid of me and they hid when I came home. They hid behind the door. My wife was terrified of me because I used to beat her. I would take my wages on Friday and instead of bringing my wages home, I would go to the hotel or the bar. He said, people disliked me I was so rough and I was so angry. But he said, Jesus found me. And Christ came into my life. And now my children, when they see me coming home from work, they run to meet me. And my wife runs out and she is so glad. And we have food on the table. And we're even starting to pay off our house. He said, I'm not the man I used to be. I cannot explain your arguments, but Christ saved me. Christ is the greatest argument for the presence of God. Amen. Now, the next point. What is the presence of God like? We have established that there is a presence. Now, what is the presence of God like? It is all light, life, love, joy, peace, goodness, and warmth, and happiness. And that's included in joy. But joy transcends happiness. The presence of God is the very opposite of despair, melancholy, coldness, and darkness. Some people, often very religious, do not have the presence of God. After spending time in their presence, you will feel, oh, you know, you will feel worse than loneliness. You wish you could be lonely. <laughs> you will feel as though the marrow of life has been sucked out of your bones. They are religious and they fill churches, but they do not have the presence of God. My advice to you is this, love them. Try to help them, but don't let them pull you down. And I will tell you something else. You cannot afford to spend too much time in the company of those who are so negative. They will hurt you. Minister to them. The Bible says, in your presence is fullness of joy. If you want to know what the presence of God is like, you can see the presence of God in the life of Christ. Come to John 14, verses 6 and onwards. John 14, verse 6 and onwards. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What tremendous claims. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen 
the Father. If you want to know what God is like, if you want to know what the presence of God is like, behold Jesus. Behold Jesus healing the sick, preaching the good news, blessing the children, defending the powerless like the woman caught in the act of adultery, dying for our sins, forgiving his enemies. There you see what the presence of God is like. It is most attractive. The presence of God is is better than a tonic or a medicine because it gives life, peace, joy, hope, self-respect, health, and power. Joy in his presence is our topic today. This divine joy the joy of his presence is overwhelming. It overflows. The joy his presence imparts is without measure and it is without limit. Let me show you some texts. Come over here to Psalm 30 and verse 11. Psalm 30 and verse 11. And if you do not have joy, my friend, it is because you do not have the presence of the Lord. Now, I'm not talking about mere happiness because joy transcends happiness. David says, Psalm 30, verse 11, you've turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. So the sackcloth goes and the joy comes. Now come to one of my favorite texts in the book of Isaiah. For the Australians who are watching, we are turning to Isaiah, chapter 35 and verse 10. So I haven't forgotten you. Isaiah, Isaiah, 35 verse 10. Look at these great words. And the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. And that is why I have a saying, blessings on your head. <laughs> because the Bible tells me there will be everlasting joy upon our heads. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Yes. How great, how superlative, how good. Come now to John 16 and verse 20 to 22. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 16 and verse 20 to 22. John chapter 16 and verse 20 to 22. I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to, what does it say? Turn to joy. You come to this place today to hear good news, so your grief can turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Amen. When you have the presence of the Lord, no one will take away your joy. Now come now to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. That is over towards the close of the canon of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. St. Peter says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I want you to say those words. An inexpressible 
and uh, glorious joy. Joy in His presence. Now, today I'm going to ask a representative group. I could have asked all of you, but we do not have room. I've asked a representative group to come up the front and to stand with me over here. So, would you like to come now, please? My sweet friends who are going to come. And if you don't belong to this church, I say I'm sorry because where else in America or anywhere do you find such an illustrious, good looking, nice group of people? Mm hmm. Don't you think they all look nice? Yeah, come over, get in close to me. Come on, come in, come over close. Blake, come in close. Now, these folks are members of this distinguished church here in Arcadia, Southern California. They are in Southern California, but they're not of Southern California. They are in the world, but they are not of the world. And uh, I could interview each one of them because each one of them is so beautiful, so nice. I stayed in a hotel on Monday night and I picked up USA News. They put it under the door. What a wake-up call when I staggered to the door all bleary-eyed, thinking I'd blotted out all the bad things that are happening in the world. And there the headlines were... America owes 62 trillion. Oh, I thought, boy, the deficit of 15 trillion looks good. 62 trillion. Didn't know that? It's been covered up. The debt is actually 62 trillion. But I don't care, my friend, about the deficit or the debt. It is not going to take from us our joy in the presence of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, this lady is the Director of Communications at the Carter Report. Her name is Susan, um, what is it? Um, Susan P. Rhino, just got it. Thank you. Now, do you have joy in the presence of the Lord, Susan? Yes, I have many reasons to have joy in the presence of the Lord, especially working within the ministry, because I have seen the Lord's hand throughout when times are tough, mm. as they are now financially, mm. I see the Lord bringing people in and mm. supplying our needs. And we have just- What do you got here? This is the Bible that we've just purchased, 10,000 Bibles mm. for the Solomon Islands. Mm. And even though we don't have the funds, but I know that God will supply and these Bibles will be given to souls in the Solomon Islands. That's why I told her to bring up the Bible so people would send us money. <laughs> so this is the Bible. We bought these Bibles, 10,000 of them. We're going to ship them out there in a week or two's time, out to the Solomons, because we want these people to have the joy that comes in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for what you do. Now, mailing. Why don't you see? I'm just getting some of you. This, this is a special lady. Where are your children? Here they are. Come forward a little bit. Okay, okay. In spite of tough times, Times are tough. You know, we're feeling it here in the United States more than in Australia and some other countries. We're feeling it. Do you still have the joy that comes in the presence of the Lord, Maylene? Yes, definitely yes. Uh, in fact, the real joy that I find is when I am in the presence of the Lord. And because my God is so merciful. Yeah. and compassionate yeah. and he always delivers me from trouble mm. so uh, when I think I realize that in the most difficult time or the most difficult hour of my life mm. and I lift my soul to the Lord he never fails mm. to give me joy and it's the joy and peace that you cannot compare with anything else in this world God bless you. You're a great mother. 
and you I shouldn't say it in front of them. Come, come over <laughs> here, both of you. Two beautiful children. We're proud of you. We're proud of you too. You. Now, I kind of interview all you folks because we just don't have time today. But we have the uh, this Elma Dixon sitting up, standing up over there. Glad to see you and Isaac and oh, you know, uh, uh, Blake. Come over for a moment because you got a Jewish background and uh, you become a a Christian. You're a member of our church. You're an elder in our church. You're a businessman you're running your own business. Uh, Blake, you better come up here too. So get on the other side of him there. So he doesn't do anything, you know, he shouldn't be doing. Okay, come forward a little bit. Okay. In spite of the recession, when things are tough in LA with a huge unemployment rate, and you know, we, we don't know when the country's going to come out of this. In spite of difficulties, do you still have joy in the presence of the Lord, Blake? Of course I do, Pastor. I have joy from my family here, mm. but the greatest joy that I get is from the Lord. And, you know, I bring a lot of baggage into that relationship. The one that we most desire to have is with the Lord. And, you know, He carries my bags. Yeah. And He picks me up and He carries me too. Yeah. And that is my greatest source of joy. God bless you. Now, folks, we're going to do something here. Hope I do this all right. You folks just come a little bit closer to help me out, you know. I mean, I'm just an old beat-up evangelist, just an old pastor, so I don't want to... Don't want to mess this up. I've already dealt with this, so I don't need to do this again. When I was a little boy going to Sabbath school in Morningside, Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, I learned a, I learned a song. You probably know it. My cup is full and running over. You know the song? When we did this song, we used to do the hand signs, you know? You don't know that song? My cup is full. It used to give my cup, and it's full and running over. I want you to know, when you have the presence of the Lord, your cup is full. God fills it right up. He fills it up. Now, if you're not a believer, you know, if you like poor old Richard Dawkins, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But once... You have the presence of the Lord. You know what happens? Yeah. Just runs over. Keeps running over. You just so you got so much blessing here that you don't know what to do about it. My brother Jose Salgati, who's a great builder, one of the best you'll find anywhere in America. Times are tough. But he's told me, my cup is full and running over. So our topic today is joy in the presence of the Lord. And I'm just real proud of you folks, and I want to thank you today for helping me out. Would you like to go and sit down? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I want you to take your Bibles again and turn over here to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. I want you to take this text home with you today. Acts chapter 2. And verse 38. You have made known to me the path of life. Jesus said that. You can say it today too. You will fill me with joy in your presence. And I want you to know today that this divine joy gives a steadfastness that the unbeliever just can't comprehend. Look at verse 25. Same context, Acts chapter 2, verse 25. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. What does it say, folks? I will not be shaken. You know the great apostle Paul had persecutions, had trouble, had tribulation. But Paul on one occasion said, none of these things move me. You know why? Because his cup was full and running over. And then the Bible talks about Moses. I don't think any man has had more trials and temptations than Moses, the prince of Egypt. I want you to come over here to Hebrews chapter 11. 24 to 27. 
but he hung in there because he had the joy of the Lord. Come over here to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and onwards. I just love Moses. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time or for a season, it says in the KJV. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. I've seen them. Because he was looking ahead to his reward, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Now, folks, I want to tell you the difference between a true believer and a person who just thinks he's a believer. It's this perseverance thing. Paul said, none of these things move me. And in spite of hell and high water, Moses persevered. He kept going ahead in faith because he was in the presence of the Lord. So I want you to know today, bad news cannot move us because we have the joy of the Lord. Nothing will shake us. And the joy of his presence gives us the hope of a glorious future. Amen. Would you come over here to Acts chapter 2, verse 27. Acts chapter 2, and verse 27. I just hang on to this. Now, this is talking, of course, about Jesus. But in a sense, we can say it too. Acts 2, 27. This is our theme passage. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Now, folks, some of us sitting here, maybe we're going to see decay. Maybe we're go going to die. We're going to go down in the grave. And we're going to be turned back to dust. But Jesus said, you haven't abandoned me to the grave. When you have the joy of his presence, you'll know that you're not going to be abandoned to the grave. As Jesus was raised from the grave, we too are going to be raised from the grave. Isn't that a great thought? That one day, you and I are going to wake up and we're going to be home. We're going to wake up and wonder where all the energy came from. We're going to wake up and wonder where the wrinkles went. We're going to wake up and we're going to wonder where the white hair went. And why some people won't need a rinse anymore. The joy that is found in the presence of the Lord gives us hope of a glorious future. So read again the passage with me. Acts chapter 2. Take it with you today and every day. And those of you watching on television. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. You can say that. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. You can say that today. My body also will live in hope. You can say amen. amen. Because he will not abandon me to the grave. Amen. amen. And this next part applies just to Jesus. Nor will you let your holy ones see decay. But you can say these words. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy 
in your presence. I glory be to God. Glory be to God. Praise his holy name. And I want every person sitting here in our great church today and everybody watching around the world on television to know the joy of his presence and the joy of his presence is yours today in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 And praise God. There are two things that a pastor shouldn't do. He shouldn't tell lies and he shouldn't retire. That's why I plan to keep on keeping on while God can still use me. While these lungs are working and while this mouth is talking and while Jesus is still alive and I'm still alive, I plan to keep on preaching the everlasting gospel. Will you pray for me? Will you support us in this great work? Listen, we have received an urgent invitation from the church in India. They're saying, come over and help us. What a challenge, my friend. Do you know how many people live in the land of India? More than a thousand million people and the place is full of demons and evil spirits. They don't want this campaign, those evil spirits, but I want you to know Jesus is stronger than the evil spirits. Last time we went to India, we had tremendous opposition. Our lives were threatened, but by the grace of God, we're going to go back because Jesus has called us to go. When we went there last time, we saw thousands of people coming to Christ. One night, 30,000 people came to Christ, Hindus and Muslims. We're praying Jesus do it again. Please support us. Please write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. In Australia, write to me, please, at Beautiful Terrigal. The address is right there on the screen. Listen, my friend, I need your prayers. I need your support. Please pray for us. I'll be praying for you right today, and God bless you.